Well, my name is Molly Nelson, and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. And we are excited to continue our virtual behind the scenes series where we take an inside look at a variety of industry leaders. Today marks our eighth event, and we couldn't be more excited to introduce our next guest. Before we begin, I have a few items to mention. First, we are using Zoom as our platform, and with that are using some features that will help us engage with each other. The main feature is using the question and answer portion of the webinar. To submit a question, use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Secondly, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our UMD Alumni Relations YouTube page. So today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Kyle Gill, who will introduce us to the applied research, teaching and outreach activities, and the long-term forest stewardship action at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Kyle has been the forest manager and research coordinator for the UMN Experiential Forest Properties since 2015. In his role, he leads an active forest management program that focuses on forests as complex adaptive systems and supports short and long-term research and education led by university faculty. His forest stewardship philosophies include trusting the only thing that is long-term, which is change, using science-based forest stewardship techniques, and recognizing that humans are a part of nature and forest ecosystem communities. And we need to approach the land stewardship with humility and respect to our community members. He earned both his graduate and undergraduate degrees in natural resource sciences and management from the University of Minnesota. For his master's thesis, he investigated forest development, dynamics relationship to climate of jack pine dominated forests, and in his free time, he enjoys many outdoor recreational activities, including cross-country skiing and skijoring, mountain biking, and wilderness exploration. I will now hand it over to Kyle. Well, thanks, Molly. It's uh, definitely a great pleasure to be here to be able to share what we're doing here at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Um, so I want to make it clear that, yeah, I'm speaking today, but I'm just one of the people that, uh, that makes the CSC the place that it is. Uh, so welcome to the Forestry Center. Um, some of the other people that uh, are a part of making the CSC what it is are our colleagues Eli and Lane, who are going to be doing a little bit of Q&A on the side, and our Director of Operations, Andy David, as well as the lead administrators and faculty members based on the St. Paul campus of the university. My goal today is to give you a brief introduction to the who, what, where, and why of the Cloquet Forestry Center. And I'll do this by bringing you to a few locations across our grounds to highlight the ongoing mission of connecting people and ideas to build understanding of northern forest ecosystems through field-based research. This is a cool opportunity because we get to not, we actually in this tour get to see not only what's going on on the ground, but we'll get to go above the canopy to uh, show you things that you might not be able to see in person. So without further ado, here we go. The Cloquet Forestry Center is roughly 3,400 acres or five square miles of land located just west of the city of Cloquet, Minnesota. This represents about 90% of our experimental forest land base across northern Minnesota. And at the CFC, we're not only located within the boundaries of the 1854 treaty area established between the United States government and the Chippewas of Lake Superior, but also within the boundaries of the reservation of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. It is extremely important to recognize this land history because it's not simply history, but the contemporary reality of the land, human and ecological communities in which we work. It influences, influences us to not only pay attention to the goals of the university, uh, but, to, but to attempt to be a community asset for the Fond du Lac people who've been in this area for over 400 years. We, the University of Minnesota, have been here just since 1909. And the Forestry Center was set up to be a place of research and experimentation related to, at that time, the new discipline called forestry. It was, uh, it was important at that point that uh, we better understood the broad understanding um, of forests because we had a, a pretty one-sided relationship with land at that point as, as in terms of European American settlers. And our research and, and teaching program is basically sought to, um, sought to learn about these systems in a way that we can then be land stewards, not only for the short-term needs, but the long-term needs. The Forestry Center itself is uh, made up of a bunch of buildings. We're getting a tour here of the buildings and grounds. That building that we just passed over there is uh, the regional headquarters of the University of Minnesota Extension Service, who serves all of Northeastern Minnesota. 
Um, the other groups that are housed at the Cloquet Forestry Center include the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative, which is a continuing education arm for land management professionals, as well as the Minnesota Tree Improvement Cooperative, which works with the genetics of various tree species and individual cooperative members to um, improve growth and yield of trees on the land and, uh, and increase our ability to manage land. One of the historical projects that we had at the Forestry Center was a nursery program. Um, back in, 19, uh, in the 19 teens, it may shock us now to say that uh, we didn't really know how to get the seeds and grow trees. And so that nursery program was kind of the first big asset that the Forestry Center had for the state. The building we're overlooking now is where our conference and meeting space and teaching space is, is housed. Um, I see the buildings and grounds area as being the hub of where we meet our mission across the forest. So in there we have a, up to 140 person auditorium. But our primary stakeholders of the Forestry Center we see as the University of Minnesota students and faculty members uh, who utilize not only these buildings and grounds facilities for their research and teaching purposes, but the broader forest itself. Uh, this is important, this is always, applied research and education has always been part of our mission because there's a certain amount of things that we can learn um, through our textbooks or on-field courses, um, but there's such a different learning opportunity when you get to go experience things in person. You get to um, smell what a white pine smells like, or you get to taste what blueberries taste like, or you get to um, do all these other things that uh, give you a better sense of, of understanding or, or of um, getting to know the land. As we circle back uh, over the buildings and grounds area, um, I'll bring up that we, we are open, our facilities are open to other, um, other users. We, we like that those users primarily are fitting within the university's mission of research, education, and outreach. Um, and sometimes in the overnight lodging that we have primarily available for students is, uh, is also available for users that are doing something that are part of a workshop or program that's specifically at the forestry center um, or is field research in the, in the nearby area. We're getting a look now at the Otter Creek corridor. This is the, the, uh, near the headwaters of a, a creek that lower down becomes a, a designated trout stream. Um, and we have new, we have beaver activity along this all the way. Um, but this, this view is cool because we get to start seeing a little bit more of the setting in which um, the forestry center is housed. A lot of people really only see the buildings and grounds area if they're coming to do workshops. Um, but this is a chance, this uh, tour will be a chance to see uh, the broader landscape setting. And we're going to start coming down and in, back into uh, a more typical way that you would first experience coming to the Forestry Center. You park in that main parking lot after coming in, turning off of University Road. And then as you near the building, you would be greeted with a sign that's welcoming your group and hopefully telling you which direction to go um, to meet up with your group. So I'll set up the next section. We're going to go to a, a portion of the forest called Camp 8. And I'll sometimes use the term stand. Um, and it's important for me to say that that's how that's a, a jargon word that foresters use to um, talk about a specific area of the forest that's basically comes down to kind of a management unit. But it's usually driven by that there's um, ecolo ecological and biological, biologically similar um, pieces within that uh, portion of the forest. We're going to head out into the woods. Um, a big difference between being able to do the do our tours in person and do the tours virtually is that I always encourage people to use all of their senses. So we're gonna do a little bit of a trial um, where I, we've got some pre-recorded sound and sights. And so this next, I think it's a minute and a half, um, you're just gonna try and immerse yourself into what you hear and see in this section of the forest.
So the reason I built that portion into this tour is because I think it's really easy to always talk about what we think we know about the forest and the, what, uh, but it's super important to have places to be, um, to have places that allow us to be still and learn from the forest because there's a lot of history built into the knowledge of these, of the forest communities. And that's the purpose of applied, uh, applied education is getting to learn from the forest itself, not just being told what we think as humans we know about the forest, but letting the forest do some of that teaching. And in order to have that teaching happen, we have to take time to be still and, and listen and smell and taste and, uh, and feel how wind moves through the trees, basically. And so this is a portion of the forest called Camp 8. This is one of our um, long-term reserve areas where we've specific, within our management portfolio, we specifically said we need to do primarily inaction as a forestry management, forest management action uh, because of what, what that allows us to learn about in terms of long-term forest development. Um, and this is a section of the forest. The majority of the forest was cut over in about 1910 of the merchantable timber at that time. And that was part of the land donation agreement um, to the university. But the university paid the value of the, of the timber in this uh, roughly 44 acre portion of the forest uh, to uh, have, it cut, have it not cut, to have it serve as an example of uh, what the pre-European settlement forest uh, looked like and how it operated. And this is, uh, has been an amazing area or a very vi rich vein of, um, of the forest to do research into not only the biological um, history of the land and the trees and the forest, but also the cultural relationship to land. So what we're learning about when we actually start to listen to these trees and start to, um, to, to ask questions of and work more, more alongside our indigenous partners and community members is that there's a long history of management uh, and stewardship more so than uh, specific management in stands like Camp 8 that happened across the Great Lakes region. Um, we've been learning about this um, uh, through fire history reconstruction work that's being led by Evan Larson, a faculty member with University of Wisconsin Platteville, who was a U of M PhD student. And also he's been looking at the fire history specifically, so looking at tree rings and, and fire scars. And then our, our colleague Claire Bowrichter is a U of M graduate student who um, led kind of cultural explorations, exploring not only the I'm getting past just looking at that biological legacy, but exploring the cultural legacy. And what we've learned from these results is that the, la the most recent hundred years has had, has demonstrated a really different relationship to land than the prior hundred years. Um, in the 1800s, our, our, um, our, the people that were stewarding the land were primarily focused on using fire and the, looking for the benefits of fire um, as, a, as a disturbance process that um, helped to support the forest community, um, primarily in terms of the understory forest community. And that's primarily, it seems like, is primarily because of the subsistence living and lifestyles that were being led at that point. And then we see in the 1900s and early 2000s, is uh, our relationship was we saw the value of the timber. And we, we basically said, well, we need to keep fire out of here. We're coming now, we're, this is a really interesting time for us because we're, as we are learning these lessons about the forest, we're trying to make sure to build that into how we're, how we're working with the forest. So we're walking up now, we've, we, in the early 80s, we decided to split into a complete inaction half of the forest, which is to the right, and a, a, a little bit of action to the forest, which is this area to the left. And the reason that we're doing this is because uh, the lesson that we've learned over long-term management of the forest is that both our actions and decisions for inactions uh, play a big role in how these forests develop and what we, can, um, what we can maybe hope for or want from the forest really depends on how we choose to either be involved or not involved. So right now we're venturing to a little bit of a new site. This is the what we call the Esker Trail. And an Esker is a geological feature that was laid down by a mostly gravel um, piece of ground that was laid down by the glaciers 10 to 12,000 years ago. And it's one of the few areas where we actually have a bit of topography at the forest. Um, but I don't wanna talk about how we're using this, but about how these uh, little tykes uh, might be using 
the esker. So the reason I bring this up is it's a good uh, ability to talk about some of, some of the ways we're trying to make sure we're a community asset for the Fond du Lac band. So in the back of that picture was their wildlife biologist, Mike Schrag. Um, we know wolves are using this trail because of the monitoring work he's been doing at the forestry center. He has a pack uh, that he tracks. Uh, he does live trapping and radio collaring on adult wolves. And this spring, the adult wolves showed that they were coming to a den site um, that we ended up going out to being able to sample those five pups. Uh, the purpose of the wolf monitoring population, which he does across the Fond du Lac Reservation, not just at the Forestry Center, but across the reservation, it's designed to understand the biology and ecology of wolves and to support those populations. Um, the results of his work show that CFC does have a, a resident pack. This spring, they had five pups. Uh, we, we, again, we were able to go out and sample those pups for, um, for sex and um, color and weight and kind of those typical monitoring type things. And, and Mike uses those data in order to, again, support this, their increased understanding of how wolves are, are utilizing the land across, uh, across the reservation. They, what his tracking showed, um, so we put little radio transmitters as opposed to GPS collars, which the uh, mature wolves have. We put radio transmitters on those young wolf pups. And it showed that they moved, uh, they moved the den site a few times after we visited their initial den site. And they uh, moved over to somewhere near the Esker Trail. We don't know exactly where it is, but almost always whenever we walk this trail, we see their signs basically in the form of, of their scat that they leave along the trail. And it's a really good reminder for us that, yeah, we, we have certain objectives for the forest and we want things to be here, but it's really important for us to understand that the forest is used by not only um, trees and plants, but a, a huge array of uh, wildlife populations. And that builds into our management and stewardship of the land as well, because um, we're, we're trying to take a holistic approach to land stewardship that is not just looking at what we might want for the forest, but what other, other community members uh, might want, including the wolves. Um, this isn't their specific den site, but their den site looked a lot like this, where it's a little bit of an upland area surrounded by wetland with tree falls and other places where they can put the pups underneath. Um, underneath those things to keep them a little bit insulated and and probably away from other predators. Um, but this is also, this Esker Trail is a part of our recreational trail network. We primarily encourage people to utilize the internal road system, but we do have a couple of just uh, walking only. Our rec for recreation, we are open to recreation across the forest. Um, we just ask that people do non-motorized recreation, non-horseback uh, recreation, as well as to keep dogs on leash. Um, knowing that we have, part of this guideline is because we know we have a very active wolf population and we wouldn't want uh, those, uh, our domesticated animals to potentially get taken by uh, uh, the wild animals that call this place home. And it's also a way for us to try and balance, we need to prioritize the re research and teaching um, purpose of the forest, but we also wanna try and balance that with being a little bit open for recreation. That's a link to a, a research feature that we had uh, Mike Schrag put together. This next stop is uh, called Be Forewarmed, and that stands for Boreal Forest at a Warm, Boreal Forest Warming at an Ecotone in Danger. This is a, a re, an, an intense research project with global impacts and global recognition, and a, an example of a really a relatively small scale, high intensity experiment um, that then informs management decisions and global modeling and a whole bunch of very large scale things. So this is, uh, this is present research looking to better understand plant adaptations to climate change in a summary. So Be Forewarmed is set up to, um, to increase our understanding of how plant and soil communities in both boreal and temperate biomes are impacted by primarily temperature and precipitation uh, because those are the major factors that we know plants respond to. Um, and it's, it's, this experiment is also then exploring how those relationships, which is mostly looking at photosynthesis um, rates and respiration rates, as well as soil respiration and phenology, a bunch of things are brought into this project. Uh, but they're able to utilize a experimental treatment um, for both temperature and precipitation in order to understand 
how the known relationship to present to precipitation and temperature change when you put them into a slightly new environment. So they're trying to pre-create uh, what the, the uh, environment we think might have, the climate environment that we think might be here over the next 50 to 100 years um, might look like and put those trees into um, that environment to understand them. So as you can see, it's kind of a, a high intensity electrical and data log, data heavy project. They use those infrared heat lamps. Um, it's set up to where there's a control system that's constantly being monitored for, um, for its temperature. And then uh, it, the, data, um, the data logger that was in that white box that we passed over then sends uh, information to the treatment plots to try and maintain a plus two and plus four degree um, temperature differential from those control plots. And we're getting a little bit of a site inside one of these plots. And obviously, data management is a huge issue for any research project, but especially a high-intensity project like this. So they use uh, tags to identify each individual tree and then track that tree's growth and, uh, and response to the experimental treatments. The major results that have been coming out of this work so far is that adaptation appears to be quite possible for a majority of species. The competitive fitness overall, though, appears to be much better for temperate species, such as northern red oak, uh, when compared to boreal species, such as black spruce. Um, full results can be found on their extensive list of research publications. They've had, that the project has been going um, and collecting data since about 2009, and uh, they have uh, a whole host of peer-reviewed research publications. Uh, I think it's over 30 at this point. Um, that uh, yeah, their furl results are very extensive. Uh, but manage their, their results then go into global circulation models that then help managers like myself that need to make on the ground decisions. Um, it helps us to make informed and educated decisions about land management and what we might do in the present day in order to, that takes into account what models are demonstrating um, the future, our future days will look like and how forests uh, may or may not be able to uh, grow over the next 50 to 100 years. And an example, the next stand we're gonna to go to is called Stand 57. And this is a stand where, we're, where I've taken some of the knowledge gained by projects like Before Warmed and actually applied that to an experimental treatment. So it is a stand scale or a, a larger acreage scale um, so that then we can monitor how some of these predictions uh, might, might happen. So all forest management is basically um, tinkering tinkering with what we think we know about the land. So I kind of followed the Aldo Leopold um, uh, philosophy of doing intelligent tinkering when it comes to making decisions about land management. Uh, this, is a, this is a demonstration site for what um, adaptive forest management for climate change looks like. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, a certain system of decision making and checking back in that uh, allows us to take account of what's in a given area, make informed decisions, and then to check back in along the way to see if those, as things like climate change actually are happening, as they, um, that we check back in with these projects to monitor the results and make any adjustments uh, according to what our desired future conditions are within that given treatment. So in this stand specifically, we had goals. We, we came into a red pine forest that was uh, over 90% um, over of the trees in the stand were red pine, and that's very undiversified. And the big things that we think about when trying to build resilience and adaptation into, uh, in, into these forest systems is to make sure that we're um, diversifying our forest, not only at the stand scale, um, but at the landscape scale as well. And if we choose to do this in a few locations at the stand scale, we then build, hopefully build resilience into our broader systems. Uh, so when it comes to this stand specifically, we decided to diversify the composition to not just have red pine, um, as well as diversify the structure. So we think of forest structure as being the vertical and horizontal arrangement of trees and other community members in a given piece of the forest. Um, so imagine before treatment, this was basically all red pine. Those are those tall, skinny trees that we can see that we're getting to the top of now. Um, what we, in order to diversify the, comp, the uh, structure, we decided to put in half-acre clear-cut gaps. 
and then to thin the remaining trees. So every treatment that we do as land managers is to try and improve the growing conditions for either the present generation or the next generation of trees. So because we did not have a huge diversity, um, diversity of tree species in here, we decided that we needed to bring that uh, compositional diversity in through planting activities. And we planted evenly throughout the entire stand, both into the high light and the moderate light environments because we know trees, trees respond differently to those different light and growing environments because those Environments also create different humidity levels. They create different competition levels. All these different parts of the forest that we try to understand here at the Cloquet Forestry Center. We did this through a specific action. Commercial logging action helps us to get these treatments done. If we have some value in the timber, that, that means that then we can use that value in order to pay for the seedlings that we're going to plant and pay for the, pay for the labor that we're going to plant. Um, what we planted into the stand was a mix of three deciduous species and three conifer species. And we chose to um, use the models that projects like Be For Warm develop. It's a specific modeling um, process called, that was the tree suitability index. And we wanted to get one species that was predicted to improve in, in competition or in, in importance value in the next 50 to 100 years. Importance value is basically its ability to exist within a given portion of the, of the forest and to grow well. Um, we chose one that is currently here in, this, in a stand like this that maybe isn't predicted to do that well, and one that is novel to this um, fire dependent community. And those species are tamarack, um, paper birch, jack pine, eastern white pine, northern red oak and baroque and we have pretty extensive uh, communications out about um, this project um, that there will be a link to at the end um, basically i think that a big thing i want you all to to walk away with from here is that the forestry center is a place where we get to understand uh, we're trying to build our understanding of our relationship to land and it's important for us to think of ourselves as land stewards and to recognize that a diversity of actions and inactions are required in order to balance the wide ranging demands we place on our forests, not only in Minnesota, but uh, across um, the US and across the globe. So thank you all so much for, um, for being willing to, uh, to come on this virtual tour. I, uh, I think we've got a good amount of time for questions here. So I'll um, ask Molly to, uh, Molly's gonna moderate the question and answer session for us. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kyle, for that tour and insight regarding the Forestry Center. Um, we are now going to transition to the Q&A um, section of our webinar. Um, so feel free in the bottom part of your screen, um, just click on the Q&A tab and um, submit your question, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. So the first question, I think we'll circle back. Um, are there any relationships or partnerships with the Fond du Lac band to give them access to what was initially their land? That's a super important question, Molly, um, because there's, as we're building our understanding of, um, of land history and treaty rights and all those things, it's really important for us to be aware of, uh, of not only our history, but um, um, yeah, the entire history of land, uh, which has, um, uh, it's it's interesting to dig into. We'll we'll say that. So we don't actually uh, more specifically to this question. There's there's a lot else my mind is spinning on with a question like that. But uh, mo most importantly to this question, there's no formal agreement that the University of Minnesota has with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, what we're trying to do in the meantime, without any formal partnership agreement, is to build bridges through professional and personal connections. So that project that that we highlighted with Mike Schrag is a good example. Uh, we have other projects where we're trying to make sure that that we can make sure uh, try and make the forestry center a community asset um, for the broader community. Um, it's the forest is open uh, to general use and and recreational or gathering use. Um, what we ask people to do, uh, both indigenous and non-indigenous, is um, uh, because that land history is is the current reality. We have indigenous people that um, and people with indigenous backgrounds that um, use the forest, luckily, and and as well as your people of European American or other um, cultural backgrounds. Um, what we do for gathering, 
um, which is uh, an important cultural practice. Um, so gathering of balsam boughs or blueberries or other things is we have a collection uh, permit process, a gathering permit, and that's both for commercial and non-commercial gathering. And we, we uh, keep, we use that uh, process because it helps us to make sure that we're um, both, we're steering gatherers away from areas where it might negatively impact um, a project or where um, a research project had, takes priority. Um, but then uh, that also helps us to be able to try and balance our actions across the landscape um, and across the forest, because we know this is a high use area. So it's important to balance uh, the actions that we take on the forest. So short answer, we don't have a formal agreement like an MOU or anything like that, um, uh, but we're trying to build as many bridges as possible through um, personal and professional relationships. Um, and now we have a question about the 1918 fires, wondering how was this site affected by them? Yeah, we had, so our land base was primarily cut over in, in 1910 of the Merchantville timber. And so there's a, there was a chance that all that slash that was down um, could have been a really big fire hazard. But for some reason, and we don't know exactly why, um, the 1918, the big 1918 fires didn't impact our lands. Um, so we were stands, which is, we're, we're fortunate because we have stands like Camp 8 and others where we have trees that are not only 200 years old, but potentially 250 years old. And so um, it serves, that's, we recognize that we're a little bit unique on the landscape in that, in that regard that we weren't burnt over. And so we still have the ability to learn the lessons of longer, um, of prior generations through um, those assets that are still on the forest. Um, so yeah, we, we weren't, we weren't um, impacted by the 1918 Cloquet fire. Our next question, there's actually two of them. Um, perhaps you can answer both. Um, are there genetically engineered trees in this area? And then kind of the second part is, is it bad to plant non-native trees? Genetic engineering is an interesting question because that makes it sound like there's um, people in lab coats that are, are um, doing like uh, gene modifications and stuff like that, um, th which to my knowledge, we don't have any research um, um, like that here at the Forestry Center. What the related, I mean, there's been genetic um, trials going on basically forever. That's just called hybridization and interbreeding. And that's where a, a program and cooperative like the Minnesota Tree Improvement Cooperative comes in. It's shorthand is MTIC. They're doing genetic research um, and basically doing that, uh, the tilting of the scales to one genetic trait versus another um, based upon uh, hybridization and pollen and um, pollen mixes that uh, people have been doing for generations. So there, yes, there's active genetics research going on, but it's not necessarily um, taking place in a, in a laboratory setting like that. I know they do lab work as well, but uh, it's, it's done through a hybridization more than anything. Uh, the non-native trees question, um, I think was the question, is it bad to plant non-native trees? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so this is, a, this is a question that could and does take entire workshops and seminars and careers, in, in fact, uh, because it's, so, it's very laden with, uh, with values, so bad versus good, and ethics and relationship to land, history, present, and future. Um, so I think the, uh, the short answer is inherently, Planting non-native trees is neither good nor bad. It just is. And, um, and it's important to, I like to point out that it's the various species have been taking advantage of human known and unknown global transport networks since at least the Colombian era. Um, so we have this kind of novel concept of what a non-native and non-native invasive is in particular. And sometimes we think this is this new thing. And there, it's probably new in some regards. Um, but it's important and I think important for me and what I, the way I approach it is that nothing is inherent, very few things are inherently good or bad. And, uh, but everything has a, every action and inaction has a risk associated with it. And so there are definitely certain risks associated with planting non-native trees, um, whether it's non-native to a given um, state or political boundary or a biological boundary like the prairie versus forest boundary that exists on the landscape. Um, yeah, there, it's important to take stock of what we might want now and what we would want for the future 
and to do a little bit of a, a risk assessment um, and an assessment of the pros and cons and risks and rewards of any decision we're making. So um, is it bad to plant non-native trees? The, the simple answer from a, a civil culturist perspective is that it, to it depends on what our objectives are. Um, it definitely can be bad, but it can also potentially be good. Perfect. Definitely bad if it's a known invasive. I do not support planting known invasives. Awesome. Well, there's another question that came in in regards to one of your programs, and they're wondering, are you still doing the ruffed grouse research? Oh, uh, yeah. So that was rough grouse research is a, a big uh, research legacy here at the Cloquet Forestry Center. So that was started um, back in the 1930s by a researcher named Ralph King. And most notably, it was taken up by a, a researcher named Gordy Gullion. He did research here at the Forestry Center and elsewhere in, in northern Minnesota from the mid 50s to the early 1990s. And um, presently, there's no active on site um, field research going on. The, the big research activity that's going on in, related, in relation to Gordy's work um, is that we're, uh, there's a, a researcher out of Central Lakes College that um, has fu had funding from the LCCMR, the um, Minnesota Legislative Commission, um, and I can't remember the, what, the, all, what that acronym stands for entirely. Um, but the, he got some funding from both LCCMR as well as the Rough Grouse Society um, to digitize some of uh, the work that was done um, at the Forestry Center. So we had these boxes of uh, punch cards that Gordy had meticulously kept throughout the years, and they were sitting in the basement of our office building, actually, because this used to be his kind of main station um, for work. And so uh, Kent Montgomery is the researcher's name. He got had that funding to be able to scan uh, those punch cards to try and make those historical data um, valuable for present and future research. Following Gordy's work that ended in the early 90s, we've had um, Rocky Gutierrez took over the in-field um, research for rough grouse. And there is a, a relatively new, Dr. Joe Bump is a relatively new um, research. I think he just started within the last year and a half or two years um, in the Gordy Gullion Endowed Chair for for research that doesn't he doesn't necessarily um rough grouse has not been his focus he's been really involved with the work i think up at uh, vermilion uh, national park and in, in better understanding wolf populations up there um and he's he's exploring ways as far as i know he's exploring ways to um to continue on that work work that gordy did because it's important to start to ask those really similar questions to what Gordy was asking for 40 years in the context of um, our predictions, the, what the models uh, suggest might, uh, what the climate models suggest, how climate might change or is going to change over the next 50 to 100 years. So he's, I know he's interested in exploring those questions, but interest in exploring then needs um, research funding and support. That's how research gets, gets done. Our next question, um, kind of in relation to climate change, says and asks, here in South Central Alaska, we've been experiencing warmer and drier summers and a significant spruce bark beetle infestation. Are spruce bark beetles a problem in Minnesota? And if so, is there research being done to control the beetle? Spruce bark beetles, um, we do not, as far as I know, an, uh, an insect specialist, an forest entomologist is um, probably going to, hopefully will answer in the question and answer, or we'll, could explore this further. But to my knowledge, spruce bark beetles are not a, a known insect in northern Minnesota. The one that the, the insect related to spruce that we most often think about and try and um, do pre some preventative management uh, for is um, the spruce budworm, which kind of ironically primarily impacts uh, balsam fir. And then we'll also go after spruce as well. That's a native insect that um, the DNR has a long history of tracking uh, how spruce budworm outbreaks um, go across the state. Um, and their, their insect and disease or forest health group has reports back to the late 60s that spruce budworm is specifically identified basically every year. But to the best of my knowledge, um, spruce bark beetles isn't something that we um, that we're taking into account when it comes to our management actions or inactions. Kind of a fun question here, wondering how tall are the tallest trees at the center of the forest? 
Um, yeah, there's, uh, it's really fascinating to think about this question. I got to meet a researcher uh, by the name of Steve Spurrier who does work in tall trees across the globe. But um, he, I remember him saying something of the sort of, there's, there are just physiological limits to how tall a tree can be. And what species a tree is then um, very significantly impacts um, the, uh, the physiological limits and the height limits of, of a given tree. So we, don't, we definitely don't have the tallest trees um, in, in the world. Um, he said, if I remember correctly, he said a majority of species kind of max out around um, 30 meters or, or um, about 100 feet. And that's about what we see around here. So the, how tall a tree gets really depends on the growth environment that that tree is in as well. Um, I know we have a, a white pine here that's growing on one of our richer sites um, that was measured at 130 feet, which I think is probably the tallest tree we physically measured. Um, a majority of our red pines and white pines, the old ones, tend to be in the kind of 85 to 105 feet tall. Um, but I know we have that one recorded just from a few years ago, a white pine at 130 feet. Um, so it's, it's punching above its weight, so to speak. But things then like uh, gravity um, and wind start to impact those trees as they reach above the canopy. And, and it um, uh, probably is not quite that tall anymore. But it won't keep growing up indefinitely because there are just physiological limits to how tall a tree can get. And for red and white pine around here, which are tend to be our tallest species around here, um, that tends to be right around 100 feet. Perfect. Well, I think we're, we have time for one more question. Um, and the question asks, can we donate to plant a tree in someone's name? That, uh, that's a pretty interesting, that's a very interesting question. Um, that's um, planting specifically in honor of somebody is not something that we've um, done on a regular basis. We basically have tree planting going on all the time. Um, it's often at kind of more operational scales where we're planting, um, say, roughly uh, four to 400 to 1,000 trees per acre. So we don't necessarily specifically say that these trees are planted in somebody's uh, honor. Um, I, I know we do have, there's an opportunity for that. If if somebody wanted to donate, that'd be awesome. I know, I'm pretty sure through our website, there's a way to um, donate. And whether or not, it's, I'm not totally sure if whether or not uh, we have the, uh, we probably do have the ability to specifically put that into tree planting. Um, so say somebody wanted to donate to, um, um, a given tree planting effort, I think we could potentially, I can't guarantee that we can say that yes, these these monies that somebody's donating um, can specifically get channeled into um, tree planting efforts, but it's definitely something worth exploring. Um, so that would be, maybe maybe you all in the alumni relations know those, those funding streams a little bit better than I do and know whether or not that's even possible. More than likely, I like to take the I like to take the possibilities, not limitations mentality into questions I don't know the answer to. So, uh, which is often the case when it comes to forest management, land stewardship decisions. So it's, I, I'd say, let's look for the possibilities and um, see if there are any limitations along the way. And you know what? We just had one more come in, um, our final question. What are the typical opportunities for the public to be a part of besides recreating? And then opportunities for youth, and we'll end on that note. So the, what we've started to do now is um, have a, an open house annually. This, have, this is our third year that we're gonna do that. And this actually, today's virtual tour is kind of a, a stand-in for our um, in-person open house. Um, so that's kind of a once a year opportunity that people can come out and, and learn more about the research and um, land stewardship, pro education and land stewardship programs that are going on here. Um, we don't necessarily have um, specific opportunities for adult general continuing um, uh, education or, or things like that. That's something that's more in the, in the realm of uh, extension. And even though we're the university, there are other people that are specifically doing extension and outreach. Um, I know I get um, requests from groups to do forest tours, in-person forest tours, and during the uh, non-COVID era, um, more often than not, that's even though that's not a, um, uh, a specific thing that's in my job description, I think the general outreach and being able to get people out on the forest to experience the land is um, something that I, I 
try and prioritize when I when people ask about it. So if somebody has were to have like a group of say 10 to 20 people or more, um, they could um, get in touch with me or get in touch with our office and see if they can potentially get a uh, an in forest tour. We've been exploring a little bit with extension, um, the poss more possibility volunteer opportunities and um, building that through the Master Naturalist program. That's not something we currently um, have in place, but um, generally if, if you ask, there are probably things that people can be doing to, uh, um, to either volunteer or to, to learn more about what's going on here. For youth specifically, our programs, um, uh, Rachel Alishak is our, is, works with me in the Forest Management and Research Group, and she leads um, a few different youth education programs. And uh, the one that's been going now, this will, will uh, this would have been, we had to postpone it to spring, but would have been our, I think our 52nd year in a row of doing um, what we, the title of the program is Conservation Education Days. So that is a uh, education program, uh, an on forest, a one day education event for all the fifth graders of uh, Carleton County and um, people that live in the Duluth area might know it or know a similar program called um, fifth grade forestry field days. Um, there's really similar programs that were both started out of people that were doing work here at the forestry center in the sixties. And um, that is specifically for Carleton County um, students. Um, but the, um, Rachel has also started what, sh what we call Forestry Adventure Days, and those are um, youth education opportunities, basically like day camps. It's, there's a spring offering and a summer offering um, where uh, I think it's any students anywhere between um, uh, kindergarten and sixth grade can come be participants, and if they're older than sixth grade, they can um, uh, apply to volunteer with uh, Forestry Adventure Days. So it's uh, a way for us to get students out here on the forest, um, youth, youth students that aren't necessarily part of the university system out here on the forest to um, learn about how to be in relationship with land. Um, well, that pretty much uh, does it for our event today. Thanks again to Kyle for taking the time to share with us an inside look at the Cloquet Forestry Center. If you do have other questions that weren't answered, um, here is the website for CFC and our office. Um, you can feel free to reach out and we'll get back to you. Also, please keep an eye out for upcoming alumni and friends online learning sessions. You can visit our website at d.umn.edu backslash alumni for more information. And here's um, an upcoming event at the Forestry Center um, for you to mark your calendars as well. So again, a big thanks to Kyle, and we hope that you will join us again for future events. Thanks again and have a great day.